So now we're gonna switch gears, and uh, Christopher Hogue is gonna take us into the life sciences. Um, I'm hoping with some disaster porn, but you know, that's just, uh, yeah. Um, so Christopher, I'll tell you what. Jet lag is a disaster <laughs> So I am a scientist. A real scientist. Um, apparently. So, um, right, I'm a scientist, I know what I'm doing. Um, an abacus for complexity. So I'm going to talk about systems, um, and one of the systems that I've been playing with, um, it's about 2009, is the ribosome. The ribosome is the molecule, it's actually a, a constellation of molecules, that uh, produces proteins and decodes genes. And um, sure, let's do it. Okay, so this is uh, produced by the uh, Nobel Prize winning laboratory in the UK of uh, the three-dimensional structure of the ribosome starting with the small subunit. And this uh, snaky thing here is the uh, messenger RNA, which is a copy of the genetic information from the DNA. And that gets wound around the small subunit. And then a number of other molecules that you see floating around in proteins. The ribosome itself, the small and the large subunits, are made up of RNA and proteins, and it forms a complex system. The machine works kind of like you know the Turing machine. The tape goes through. That's the messenger RNA. And these molecules are transfer RNAs. They dock onto the messenger RNA and, and recognize the triplet codon that is the genetic code, and they physically carry amino acids, and the amino acids are the building blocks of proteins. The movie's going to get sped up, I'm going to skip the part. And yes, thanks for the optimal resolution of the location. <laughs> and um, when we get out here, we see the protein growing out of the backside of the ribosome. And um, once that protein grows, I, no, I skipped over the top, the fun part. Okay, so these are the transfer RNAs, and it's going to speed up. Okay. All the details, the spin away. Yes, there we go. Okay. Simulation. Um, this is based on uh, the three-dimensional crystal structure of the ribosome in various forms for which the 2010 Nobel Prize is awarded. And the, the disaster porn that's buried in here is that a lot of the um, three-dimensional structures that are moving were actually found by um, mutations in uh, stalled ribosomes that are the disasters. There you go. So, so that's the complex system. And if we um, we'll put that aside for a moment and consider the words of uh, Doug Hofstetter in uh, the, the we go from the Nobel Prize to the Pulitzer Prize, the uh, <laughs> the uh, Gödel Escher Bach book. And, and I know a lot of people who own the book, and some people actually read it. Uh, but if you get to this part and, and, and slog through the math, um, this, uh, this, is, this is where it refers to, uh, he's got a whole chapter on the ribosome. And this is before the three-dimensional structure was solved. So that image that you saw is based on crystallography data, and we have coordinates for every atom in the ribosome. And before that, um, this was, uh, was his postulate that this was, this had to start somewhere. This complex machine had to start from simple beginnings. And if we understood that bootstrap process, um, we might um, find it to be similar to the uh, computer languages. And so I'm here to tell you that um, this is the simple part that probably um, was the starting point of the ribosome. It's very much smaller than the structure that you saw, but it has the core of the small subunit, which is the decoding center, and it has the core of the large subunit from which the protein is extruded. Uh, and it has these other little features here, mini tRNAs, which were found by another completely different branch of science, which looked at the L-shaped tRNAs, the transfer molecule, and found that after lots of sequence analysis, they probably uh, at some point duplicated from two copies of these smaller ones. And amazingly, this all fits together in a nice little compact structure. So probably what 
origin of protein synthesis look like? About, um, I'm going to guess 3.8 billion years ago, but it's a guess. I really should be a physicist and invent a time machine to know for sure. But um, since we don't have those things, um, what we do have are things like um, the design structure matrix. And this is how that structure was deduced. So um, anyone who works in engineering is familiar with the design structure matrix. Um, I'm going to give you a crash course on, on this system. Uh, but the essential points here are that um, that core proto-ribosome was found strictly by three-dimensional topology. And uh, in some instances, uh, the one-dimensional topology of sequence. So this is the small part of the ribosome. This is a, the, the ways um, scientists draw the RNA parts of the structure. And, and these little um, aligned parts here are RNA hairpins. This um, was cut kind of like a bonsai tree into pieces that have inserted into one another um, over the timeline. And um, the blocks here that you see in this matrix are dependencies of insertions into the sequence. And these lines here are proteins that are added onto the structure. And that, that matrix gives you this information. And it is the accumulation or the accretion of complexity on top of the core. We start with this thing. This is the starting point. And that matrix allows us to walk backwards in time back to the simple core. And what this does without any kinds of theory on whether or not RNA or protein came first, strict topology and three-dimensional contacts um, tell us that if you go back step by step and peel away these things layer by layer, you get back to RNA, not protein. That's the small subunit. The large subunit um, has a similar process. Uh, this is the part that synthesizes the protein. The small subunit decodes the gene. And again, here we see the RNA comes first. And again, the same process. We start with the, the complete structure and walk backwards peel away layer by layer, following the topology of the addition of proteins and RNA back to the core. So we, we have, in my lab, done what Doug Hoffs better said would be really hard to imagine. And it was done with um, a design structure matrix. And so I refer to this as an abacus for complexity because it's, um, it's not quite an algorithm in that an abacus isn't really quite an algorithm either. It's, just, it's sort of a one-dimensional symbolic thing where you flip things around. Um, anybody here use an abacus? <laughs> See, if I was in Singapore, I'd get a lot of people. Um, but I'm not. Um, so it's a, um, a symbol manipulation method um, that uses um, a two-dimensional plot. And uh, very, very essentially, the, the plots have tasks elements on a timeline that are uh, always formed up into these square matrices. And the tasks might be um, components of a, pro uh, a project. And what you plot in here are the dependencies. And those might be topological contacts, or the insertion of one gene into another, or um, an API that is consuming uh, another piece of information. So, so the inputs and the outputs of each task are plotted as simple markers. and then the rows and columns are reorganized to partition the majority of those markers into uh, a triangular formation. You'll see upper and lower triangular forms. It doesn't matter those sort of conventions. But um, this partitioning process um, organizes the tasks into the first task with the fewest dependencies, and then the next task with more dependencies, and so on. And it's simply an increasing scale of complexity based on the dependencies that you put in these markers. So it's, it's abacus-like because you can actually move these rows and columns around in software and, and sort of figure out um, what the relationships are between these things. You can strictly use a numeric method and come up with a triangular form, but many times um, it's really hard to arrive at a single solution. There are many suboptimal solutions that you kind of have to fiddle around with it. But um, this is the relationship between the five tasks going through the automatic sorting that you see in this example. So without um, 
belaboring the point, the canonical uses of DSM have been um, you know, taking things like engines and figuring out how to organize teams to design interconnected parts. So an engine needs a cooling system, and this is the dependency matrix of how to, how to engineer a cooling system to match the capacity of heat generated by the engine. And also, uh, there's an interdependency there because the cooling system actually uses energy from the engine. So it is a drain and also the cooling system. So those are interdependent tasks. And they produce these matrices that have marks on both sides of the matrix. And um, if you remember back to the ones I showed you, the ribosome, they were completely upper triangular. There was no marks on the other side of the matrix. That's the difference between intelligent design and evolution. Mm -hmm. You can actually see it in the matrices. So, so the um, can other canonical uh, DSM, this is done by Steve Eppinger, and, and I took his course at MIT Sloan School um, in 2003, and that's when I started using this. Uh, this is a semiconductor design, which um, is, is one of the systems that has been using this. And I, I'm sorry, you can't read any of these. And, uh, but again, to illustrate that um, complex design where there are interconnected parts and um, iterations um, that, that span both sides of the diagonal. Those are very common in, in human engineering projects. And there are software tools that use DSM to uh, analyze source code bases and come up with call graphs and you can find um, uh, you know, libraries that are um, having nested, or sorry, concurrent calls to one another and you can detangle those systems. But um, the actual part of what I want to sort of give you as the system's message is dealing with organizational complexity. And uh, this is a legacy river. It's like River 12. Right? Now, what did River 1.0 look like? Um, so how did it get this complicated, and what do I do first? If you're not familiar with this, these are oxbow uh, lakes that form as the river meanders over time. And, uh, it's always been one river, but leaves behind these little legacy pieces of itself. So um, with regard to cloud computing, uh, a very recent article came out uh, after an analysis uh, and interview of chief information officers. And 56% of them say um, they would put on their Facebook status. It's complicated. Um, <laughs> complexity of their own information and communications technology is the biggest barrier to uh, organizational uh, enterprise-wide adoption, and 60% are concerned that cloud providers don't appreciate how complex their systems are. Um, and so I was a CIO once and, and ran, uh, as well, a nonprofit organization building databases of molecular complexity and uh, how components inside cells fit together. Um, and so it had a $27 million budget. And, 40 database curators and 20 developers. And this is the DSM that I made in 2003 of the interconnection of communications between the 143 tasks that were listed on our project grant. And the communications included both people talking to people and APIs, computers talking to computers. And um, it uh, looks like kind of a mess at the moment, um, but there's a few. Um, uh, things if you actually know what the labels are that you can identify. And this is this is by the way a non-canonical use of a DSM <laughs> um, because it's mixing in the human communication and the computer communication. Yeah, I wanted to ask you: Did you want to just demonstrate mastery of this? No, I, I, I there's a, there is okay. there's a message at the okay. end. <laughs> <laughs> there's an observation that's really important. And it, and it relates to um, figuring out what to do first in the system. Um, and I didn't realize it until years after I had done this plot. But um, these were actually the, the team architectures that I made after plotting out all this communication. Um, I had people developing uh, software systems for doing very complex database um, data entry. Um, it, it, it looked like quick tax or the, the tax preparation type. There were that many fields in the database. And so they had to sit next to database curators in order to have a customer feedback effect. And so that uh, that's actually illustrated here um, in the curation loop between database curation and the database developers. They're designing the front end. So I actually moved these people out of the bullpen where I had 20 developers 
and put the developers next to the curators so they would have the uh, feedback. So this was uh, incredibly helpful in understanding things, but it's non-canonical because I, I didn't use the algorithms. I played with it by hand. And that's where the lesson comes out of this. That the, um, this, these red stripes you see the, at the bottom are actually the customer facing components. They are the outreach websites, FTP sites, um, uh, uh, API manuals. This is, this is actually a big life sciences API system um, that this has a lot of requirements into. Database curators use the database software that calls information about genes and proteins. And so it turns out that when I did another one of these things for um, a startup company that um, never got funded, um, I, I, I noticed this important feature that I learned from the previous step, which is to actually pin or constrain the DSM so that the customer-facing systems are at the edge and the infrastructure is at the top. So that's actually the important part of this. And what that does is it spreads out all the projects. So you can see what has the fewest dependencies and what has the next fewest dependencies and what is the most complicated. So if you're looking to try to figure out how complicated your system is and how to migrate it to the cloud, this is the roadmap. You do this first, then you do this, then you do this. This is an explicit representation of the complexity in stages. Um, in terms of greenfield deployment, when I um, sold off all this intellectual property to Thomson Reuters and moved to Singapore, I started up another laboratory and set up a small instance of just an IT setup, and that was the upper blue corner that I showed. Let me just flip back here. I have this blue corner at the top. That's just a, a, a physical hardware uh, infrastructure. And it turns out that um, setting up the physical hardware infrastructure forms a DSM that is that looks kind of like the ribosome one. It, it's kind of almost perfectly triangular. And this may be why people who are setting up infrastructure think it's pretty simple, because there aren't a lot of uh, cross-dependencies in setting up. There, there is a rational way to set up um, you know, a rack of servers and an operating system and uh, an authentication mechanism and the layers that, that fit together. It's really when you start putting into the system the business logic that it gets complicated. So that may be um, why the CIOs see this is the complicated part, this is the simple part. So that's the take home message that DSMs can untangle the complexity at all levels of abstraction from the molecular to the entire organization. But um, effective DSMs for understanding this deployment that we have and these legacies of, of code and people talking to people and projects uh, interconnected, they're made up of a mix, in this case, of human and computer communications. And the simplifying constraints are to pin the infrastructure of the upper left and pin the customer facing systems to the bottom. And that's what I have to say. Uh, so, I'm just wondering whether this approach which you're talking about DSMs really apply to more coupled systems or uh, in, the, in terms of if you, if you think about coupled versus loosely coupled sort of a thing. Uh, seems like it's more towards coupled for me, but uh, the other question which is kind of corollary with that is that does this actually apply to emergent phenomena in a the, in the complex IT infrastructure, uh, which probably this does not also take care of. I haven't looked at enough examples to okay. actually say what an emergent phenomenon is. Okay. Yeah, does it kind of DSM be enhanced to, to explain the mutations? Like if we go back to the previous the initial slide, we talked about the mutations. How can I see the factors that were causing that? Because you talk about dependency, but I feel more structural, but I don't see the, the cause for the, for the mutation. Can the DSM? The mutation on the the, the cell here, the mutation that you're talking about. Uh, so you're okay. not explaining why. Yeah. You have to have the algorithm. Lightning talk. I'm, I'm sorry. That, 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 that's, that's well, can it be done? I just want to know. Can it be done? Can DSM be used in that way to explain that? Or um, can? Yes or no? 
they're, they're different concepts. Um, yeah, I, I, I understand. Yeah. So, so, so the, um, the illustration of um, how the ribosome moves yeah. uses, extracts information from um, way back in, in the scientific journals about mutations. Um, there's no mutation information in the data that I use to make the DSM. Okay. It is just one crystal structure, one fixed set of topology. There's no information about motion. Okay. Uh, and there's no information about what parts are similar to what other uh, ribosomes from what other creatures. It's just a single piece of information. I, I don't mean to cut in, but just to answer that question a little bit, because I've been using DSMs as well, and they're, they're pretty cool. DSMs, like many of the visualizations, give you a, a, a pattern that you didn't previously know about. Now, I can point a performance tool at an application, and I just don't know where to start. But a DSM can tell me, this is an interesting pattern. And so I can filter down on that, and that gives me a starting point for then figuring out why. So it's another application that actually tells me why, answers the why, but it's the DSM that has let me filter my problem space right down to a particular interaction. Can you pipe D-Trace into a DSM? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that too long. I, I, I can help you get that company funded, actually. <laughs> Um, Christopher, thank you. That, that, that was terrific. Um, I think it, um, it, it reminds us of a couple of things. Um, one, um, as complicated as, you know, we always bemoan how complex our systems are. Um, and as a reminder, we, our systems are enormously simple compared to truly complex systems. Um, two, these systems are really all meaningless bullshit. Um, <laughs>